I'm really looking forward to the session today. And one of the things that a lot of the folks here in this room drove, again, from our partner advisory board, was this whole topic around digital transformation and, in fact, digital disruption. So we have a real treat for you here today. <clears throat> we have Jeffrey Moore, who will be coming to the stage in just an instant. And, um, and as you heard yesterday from Meg, she really went into some detail about digital disruption and digital transformation, how important that is. So you and the Partner Advisory Board drove this topic and drove this agenda. So Jeffrey's gonna get into it here shortly. And again, it's not, he's not gonna go into like three clicks down on digital transformation and all that. It's more on how to apply that. And it's how to apply that to your businesses. And very importantly, the tie that I want you to look for and the tie I want you to think about is how this really connects in with the transformation areas, okay? So when you think about digital transformation, di digital disruption, is that tie that, we're, that we care deeply about with our key strategy, which is here to stay around the whole transformation areas, okay? So without further ado, I'd like you to please put your hands together and welcome Jeffrey Moore to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, um, you know, when I uh, first entered this industry a while back, I wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. And the idea behind that book was, how does a startup catch a wave and sort of ride it to success? This book is at the other end of my uh, career with the, with the industry, and it's, it's the companion challenge, which is how does an established enterprise catch the next wave? It turns out that, that, that's, that, that it has all the challenges that Crossing the Chasm has, plus, it creates a crisis of prioritization around resources, because how to allocate resources across the established business and the new business becomes a, a, a critical factor. And, and, and at a crucial moment in the, in the transition, there's not enough resources to go around. So that creates a crisis of prioritization, and, and it's not one that we've handled very well in our industry. So the, the purpose of zone management frameworks is to say, let's give ourselves a vocabulary and a set of frameworks that lets us face this issue squarely and deal with it in a principled and open manner instead of in the political manner that it is normally tried to be addressed. So when you're listening to this, and this is work based on uh, work done with Salesforce and Microsoft and earlier uh, uh, in my career, Cisco. So all three companies that very much have, have uh, faced this challenge. As you're listening, I kind of hope you'll listen with two, two points of view. One is, how do you and HP help your customers navigate digital disruption? Because that's kind of what they're looking for you for help to do. And secondly, how will your own company handle your own crisis of prioritization as you could fa uh, face digital disruption because all of you have established business models that are also getting disrupted. So I think you should maybe try to listen in stereo, <laughs> some sort of thing like that. So let me kind of get into this. So this issue of the next wave, all I want to do with this is say, look, these are very uh, familiar waves to everyone in this room. We've been seeing them unfold over the last decade pretty dramatically, kind of in an escalating set. And so cloud, smartphones, social networks, et cetera, people know those words. I think the thing that you can help your customers understand is when should they try to catch that wave? And the answer is the wave becomes impactful across a, a, a vertical industry or, or a horizontal capability when it takes the marginal cost of something that used to be very expensive and scarce expertise and makes it virtually free and ubiquitous. So let me give you, a, because I think these are, this is kind of a key point as to why would you invest now? So cloud computing basically makes it free to deploy software. Now, it doesn't make it free for your customers because they have to employ, they have to integrate cloud into on-prem, into whatever. It's actually more expensive for an established enterprise to enter cloud. But if you're a startup, it's basically free. Aaron Levy and his buddies at Box start, start Box at, you know, in 2007 in USC in a dorm room. Okay? And it deploys it globally. You can deploy software for free. So that means any startup will automate anything because it's, it, it's, it's, it's clearly the obvious thing to do. But no established enterprise is set up to do that. Smartphones, now you can communicate with a billion growing to two billion people in the planet literally for free. You don't buy their device, you don't pay for their cell bill, you don't pay for the internet. Are we set up, are your customers set up to do that? Of course not. 
That's not how we set up our systems. But if you're a startup, that's where you start. And so all of a sudden you see these, these startups scale so, so rapidly. Well, that's because they can do this for free and they designed it into their business. This is where the disruption is coming from. Social networks lets us collaborate at any scale for free. And you know, collaboration came into the industry, in my experience, originally with the Linux open source movement. All of a sudden you saw, wow, people will work for free and produce amazing things. When I grew up, the Encyclopedia Britannica was sort of the, 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 the yeah, right, it was the hallmark of truth. Wikipedia in 10 years completely revolutionized that industry for free. So, so, so it's, it's the marginal cost going to zero. Data science isn't yet free yet, but once you have the algorithm, you don't pay the algorithm cost of living increases, right? The, the algorithm actually works for free. And if you can put us, and so that means you can optimize any digital system if you have access to its logs over time for free. And, and so again, every startup builds machine learning into their business model from day one. Most of us do not have access to the logs that would allow us to feed machine learning algorithms. So big challenge for established enterprises. And by the way, when you put a sensor on something, you make it a digital system, which means in your lifetime, we should be able to optimize any physical system or maybe our children's somewhere in that window for free. So this is why when you're spending time with customers and they're saying, should I worry about digital? Is it time? Well. Where, are, where is your industry in relation to these, to these issues is the question you would ask. So, so that's the key idea. That's where the disruption is coming from. Now, it's digital and it's changing all the design rules. All the design rules that we grew up with are being, are being disrupted by, by the new design rules. So that's the, that's the, that's the force that's coming in. The other framework I want to share at the beginning of this thing is how you can process those forces as a customer and also as a partner of HP. And basically, I think this model is, is a really important model because it says, look, there are three levels at which we can engage with disruption. We can simply use it to modernize our infrastructure. If we're going to do that, basically, we, we want to be more efficient. We want, to, we want to improve the bottom line. So instead of building a data center, how about you put it in the cloud? Instead of deploying you know, proprietary laptops, how about you just do bring your own device? You're, you're not changing your operating model. We're not changing the business model. We're just changing the IT infrastructure model. If that's the game, and for many industries, that's the right game to play this year, and for many companies who are in a given state, it could be the right play, game to play, you don't need to go outside of the IT department. You can go straight to the IT department. They have budget. You have to compete for that budget. Now, good news, bad news. The good news is the budget is already there. The bad news is it's earmarked for everybody. And the fight for that budget is fierce. And the margin pressure that's created when you fight for that budget is painful. But the budget exists, OK? So, 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 so and the other bad news is it's about 1% of the total customer budget on OpEx, OK? So that should tempt you to think about going up. What the operating model says is, look, uh, and this is often true of companies that are getting disrupted, I can't sit still. I have to modernize my operating model. I need to become more effective. I'm the San Francisco cab company. I can't let Uber take over my world. I have to have my own mobile app, and I have to be able to, to use it in competition with them. I still have a different business model. The San Francisco cab company buys its own cars and employs its own drivers. Uber doesn't do either of those. Uber owns no drivers and, and, and owns no cars. So it's a different business model, but it's the same operating model. Well, and, and this is where all the money is, by the way, just to, the, the, just to give you the, the headline. It's in the orange zone. It's every other company that's not Amazon, that's not Tesla, that's not Uber, that's not Airbnb, that has to modernize their operating model in order to respond to the challenge of the disruptive uh, innovator. Now, to do that, you have to get access to the other 99% of the budget. There is no IT budget for the orange activities. You have to go recruit that budget. The CIO has to help you, but the CIO is not a salesperson. You are. Okay? So it's your job to help the IT person navigate the CIO-CXO relationship and help release, get people in the CXO role who have operating budget for other purposes, CMOs who could put it into advertising, operating executives who could build another factory, Sales executive that could hire more salespeople and say, look, take a portion of that money and put it in digital instead. 
That's a very good decision for a lot of businesses right now, but it won't happen without a conversation. That is something you have to sell. It's not something you can expect to be given to you. Okay? Which means we have to figure out, how, we have to create messages and dialogues and thought leadership events that bring CXOs into the, into the conversation. That's the big challenge for our industry right now. It's always been the big challenge for our industry. And then at the very top of this thing are the people that go, heck with this, I'm going to just change the world. And it's not just startups. GE's doing this with Predix, right? They're saying, look, we think there's a whole new game to play. You know, Apple did this with phones. Apple did it with music. You know, I, we're, you can't disrupt yourself, but you can disrupt other people. And, and, and when you do that, that's a big bet. So that is the CEO, that is the board of directors, that, that's everybody. Now, when you look at that, as you can see, different partners post up against this channel in different, in different ways. So, so it, for, for, the, for the infrastructure play, which is the bulk of any sales in any year, it, it's designed for people buying products. And so distributors, resellers, infrastructure ISVs, this is, this is typically your sweet spot. This is what we're, and this is, it's a, it tends to be a more high volume transactional game. And there's a ton of business. You heard Meg say yesterday, 85% of HP's business is still basically there. The future business and the higher margin business is higher up in the triangle. So if you're, if you're in the, or going after the orange, the two, the two groups that have always had great success with the orange area are the independent software vendor because you have an application that the, that the business owner understands. They really don't understand IT, but they do understand CRM or ERP or an application that, that relates specifically to their customer service or, or whatever it is. And then the value-added reseller who's made a commitment to specialize in a particular vertical or a particular application. So both of those places are, are, are so, so smaller footprint, higher value, uh, and, and also future, you're creating the future with that, with that investment. Eventually, all that investment does go back down to the gray area. Everything gets bought eventually in the gray area, but the budget gets created above there. And then if you're going to the top, if you're a, if you're a systems integrator, you know, and, 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 and you have really, really thought leadership kinds of, kinds of folks doing, um, uh, you know, cool projects, boy, do the people at the top want you because they're, they're going to essentially do something pretty dramatic. They need great project expertise. And so these models, the product model, the solution model, and the project model kind of map to the three levels and to the type of partner you are. And it's not that you can't do work in the other parts of the triangle. It's just that it's not your sweet spot. So you have to be a little bit thoughtful about how you approach it. Where you're in your sweet spot, you should just kick ass, just take over. Okay. okay. So great. Sounds good. What's the problem? Well, I don't know. Why don't you start reading this at the bottom and, and read the rows kind of going up. And when you reach the first row where you don't recognize the names, that's when you came into the industry. Okay. <laughs> There are a number of us in this room who, by the way, can go all the way to the top and actually remember some things even before that, but we won't go there. Now look, these were not the bad companies. These were, the, these were our best companies. These people killed it. They just killed it. They, 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 rode, they rode their first wave all the way to the top, but they didn't catch the next wave. And so we got to say to ourselves, what's going on here? Because this is scary, and how do you fix this? And Clay Christensen, who's local to Boston, wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, which started to get at this, but we didn't get at the fix. So what's, so what's the fix? Well, you've got to understand the crisis of prioritization. The guys at McKinsey gave us a great model. It turns out the crisis happens during your budgeting process or your customer's budgeting process. During that process, they pass out the resources and the CFO says, when am I going to get my payback? And McKinsey said there are three horizons that make reasonable answers to that question. The first is, you're going to get it this year. Give me more headcount, I'll give you more sales. I'll give you more product, whatever it is. All the companies on the prior list did well there. They were very, very good at managing that. The rap against them was, originally, they couldn't innovate. And so you say, well, well, the horizon three is, let's just get involved with the future. Let's dare to be great. Let's be fast fail. Let's make mistakes. Let's do all that kind of stuff. Big companies can't do that. BS. Big companies can and do do that. They do it in their labs. They do it with technology uh, investments in startups. It's just, it's baloney. It's not true. They do do that. Xerox Park did that brilliantly. Hence, we have Silicon Valley. 
What they can't do, what they struggle with mightily, is getting anything from Horizon 3 through Horizon 2 into Horizon 1. So it's the Horizon 2 ask. I want you to give me a bunch of money. You're not getting it back this year. Next year, I'm going to ask you for more money, and I'm not giving that back either. Okay? Then the third year, we might start to break even here. And it, it's a tough sell, as you, as you might imagine, particularly when there's other people who are around saying, well, if you give me the money, I'll give it back to you right away. Right? So if you want to catch an S curve, which is any one of these waves, you've got to go through a J curve. And that turns out to be the crisis. So the J curve is very familiar to anybody with a spreadsheet. It turns out in venture capital, venture capital is designed to invest in J curves. That's what we do for a living. The limited partners give VCs monies to invest exclusively in J curves. The VCs give that to startups exclusively if the startup brings a J curve to the VC. The entire, and startups are, have many challenges, but they are never conflicted, ever. That's not the problem. Whereas if you are an established enterprise and you go to your constituencies and say, hey, we've got this really great opportunity to go through a J curve. So you go to your investors, no thank you, no. If we want to invest in J curves, we'll give it to the venture capital people. You just keep doing, milking that cow that we've got there and you know, keep going. You do not, do not change course or speed, okay? You go to your sales people, hey, cool new product. Yeah, but I want to go to club. And you know, the product, does, you know, actually if you know the product doesn't actually work, I mean, the demo is really cool, and we don't have any partners, and by the way, my customer has no budget for it. In fact, my customer feels threatened by it, so no, I don't want to do this, but thank you for asking, right? And so sales management says, well, what, do you want to make my number? Do you want me to make my number, or do you want me to kind of, what, what do you want me to do? So they, no, I don't want to do this. Even customers who, who say, you know, I know this is very exciting. You haven't actually delivered the last 23 things that you promised me, however. Could you, could you just work on those for a little while longer? And then the partners are going, hey guys, we have a sweet deal here. Why are you screwing it up? Okay. So the net of this thing is these conflicts create a situation where we thought innovation was a funnel. I always thought it was a funnel. It's true for sustaining. For the next Intel 8086 microprocessor, for the next release of Office, for the next Cisco router or Aruba wireless router or, or whatever it is, next data drive from whoever, yes, it's on the left. But if you're doing a disruptive innovation, meaning I have to, it's not backward compatible, there is rip and replace, I am going to have to build a new ecosystem, we are going to have to create new budget, that's when you hit the Horizon 2 challenge. And the Horizon 2 challenge is not a natural act. That was the mistake that every one of those companies made. We thought because we're in tech, it's natural for us to introduce a disruptive innovation. It is not. It is not. It puts your entire organization and your ecosystem in conflict with itself. And these are serious conflicts, and the truth is we have not faced them in a principled manner, particularly during the annual budgeting process which has been a relatively, it's been more of a horse trading political poker game than a principled activity. And so as a result, we, we've suffered the consequences. So the purpose of the zone management framework is to say, how could we have that very difficult conversation in a principled manner? Now I think that's important for everybody in this room for our own companies, but it's also important when you're sitting down with your customers and helping them try to navigate the budget issues around investing in disruptive innovation while maintaining their existing lines of business. So the zone thing just says, look, there are genuine conflicts of interest, okay? There, 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 are, there are four interest zones. Each zone has its own set of interests and its own methodology, its own metrics, its own culture, they're all four legit, but none is good for the other three. So what you don't want to do is let one zone dictate metrics or terms to any other zone. Okay. So let me kind of, and if you'll notice, the Horizon 1 zones are on the right. Under sustaining innovation, Horizon 2 and Horizon 3 are on the left. But Horizon 3, it, it, it doesn't require, you don't have to return a lot of revenue out of Horizon 3. So the problem zone is the upper left, which is Horizon 2. So let's just walk through these zones briefly. And by the way, there's going to be a copy of a book for this stuff uh, available right after we... Good. Okay. God bless Duncan. Okay. Performance zone. Performance zone. Everybody in this room probably is part of the performance zone. The performance zone is where is, is the people in your organization who make what you sell 
or sell what you make. Basically, this is, the, this is the zone that interfaces with the world. The other three zones, the world does not see. This is the only zone that they see. This is how the world experiences you. It's, how you're in, it's what your investors see. It's what your customers see. It's what your partners see. Okay, the performance zone. It's a very competitive culture, and it's all about making the number quarter after quarter after quarter. If you're an engineer, it's about shipping on time, on spec, on budget. It's a, it's a, it's a relentless, achievement-oriented culture. And, you, and very objective metrics. You either made your number or you didn't. Okay, very, very objective. The productivity zone is all the stuff you have to do behind the scenes in order to make the performance zone work. So it's, 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 it's HR, it's legal, it's IT, it's marketing. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's finance it's, it, it, and administration. It's, it's security, it's facilities, it's everything. This is not about making the number. This is about making the performance zone either more effective or more efficient or regulatory compliant, keeping you out of jail. Right? Those are the three, jo three jobs. But the thing here is the key to the, 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 uh, of the, to the productivity zone is do the right thing. That's the motto of, that's the, 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 the motto, the, the, the rallying cry of the, perform, of the productivity zone. And it's a collaborative culture. It, it tries to do whatever it takes to get the right outcome. That, that's how it does. Some of us in this room are from, the, are from the productivity zone. We support the performance zone with marketing and other kinds of capabilities. Those two zones alone, if we were never disrupted, we'd be done. My, my father's life and his entire career, all, all his career was spent just in those two zones. There was no, the left side of this diagram was not relevant to his, his generation, at least in his industry. But the incubation zone is for everybody who says, well, you're just crazy if you don't try to get your feet wet in the new stuff. And so this is where you do invest a modest amount of resources, maybe a modest amount of venture capital, in next generation capabilities, incubating future businesses. And this culture is much more of a creativity culture. It doesn't, there's no number it's trying to make. It, it's trying to invent the future. It's, it's a sort of a dare to be great culture. By the way, these three cultures, each one has a different building on your campus, or at least a different floor in your building. They don't hang out with each other, right? The people in the creative culture, creativity culture are pretty sure they're 10 to 20 IQ points higher than the people on the right-hand side, right? <laughs> and, and so they, they don't want to hang out with anybody else. And, and the people in the performance zone look down and they go, we're the only people that make any money around here, so please, you know, we're paying for everything. So. And the productivity zone is the only zone that goes, we're actually trying to do the right thing, unlike you two, right? So, so everybody's got a little bit of superior, but, but you know what? The three zones kind of get along. We, we, year after year, we can get along. The fourth zone is where you go to transform. This is the zone, unlike the other three zones, there is no floor in any building that houses the transformation zone. You cannot apprentice to be a member of the transformation zone. This is actually a virtual zone that is created by the leader, typically the CEO, to reallocate resources in a highly unnatural way and maintain accountability for probably a two to three year period. So that's a pretty damn big assignment. I am going to reallocate resources in, an, in, a, in a large system in a way that will be you know, uniformly unpopular. And I will maintain that realignment despite the fact that every muscle and everybody in my organization is trying to go back to normal, right? But if you don't do that, you can't get the, 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 the new innovation past the tipping point. That's what it takes. By the way, founders are good at this. The people that have been successful doing this are the people who own enough of the company and frankly are willful enough that you just don't get in their way. If you got in Steve Jobs' way, there was a tire track across your face. Right? Same with Jeff Bezos, same with Larry Ellison, same with Bill Gates. Interestingly, in a nicer way, same with Dave Packard and Bill Hewitt. Look, if these folks wanted to do something, by God, they were going to get it done. But most management teams are second, third, fourth, fifth generation management teams. You're not the founder. So if we don't have a principled discussion using frameworks, it, it, it's just, you can't get this done. And if you can't get it done, th then we can't get to the tipping point. So, Given those, that, 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 that fourth zone, how now do we play out the, 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 the four zones in a principled way? Well, for many years, the answer is, it's not time to transform this year. This is not a transformational year this year. If that's true, then my job is the performance zone should get the first, and when we do the annual budgeting, performance zone comes first. Do I have enough sales capability? 
to make, to make the uh, bookings number, and do I have enough uh, product capacity to deliver the revenue number? Okay? That, that's the first, this is, the, this is where we serve the world, this is where we better show up first. Assuming I have that, the second thing now is, do I have the right programs in place to do the right thing under that? Am I investing enough in employees? Am I investing enough in marketing? Am I investing enough in customer service? You know, in corporate engineering? Uh, you know, do I, have financial, do I have good financial systems? Do I have good IT systems? There's always a ton of stuff to do in the productivity zone. And once you've funded the performance zone, you get a lot of value out of that. And then, yes, I need to have a modest amount of investment in the incubation zone to find out what's going on. But I'm not, I'm not going to do transformation this year. So basically, that is the alliance. This is the normal alliance. The, the existing political method of budget allocation actually defaults to this pattern. And in a, in a, in a year where you're not being disruptive, it's OK. In fact, it's not OK. It's good. This actually is the correct pattern. So why would you screw it up? <laughs> Two reasons. The first came out of work with uh, doing with Mark Benioff and his team at Salesforce, and that is, we think we've got the next big thing. We think this is really, really worth doing, and so it's in our incubation zone. We want to bring it into the transformation zone, meaning we want to create a new business for our portfolio that will scale to 10% or more of our total revenue within three years. So this is like a big, big move. But this is obviously what Apple was able to do with the iPod and, Muse and iTunes. And then they did it again with the iPhone and the App Store. And they did it again, although a little bit less obviously, maybe with, with, with the, uh, uh, the, the iPad going, going forward. See so what Amazon has done with web services. Kind of an amazing thing. When you do this, it has to be the first priority, which means the second priority is the performance zone, which means when the performance zone leader looks at the, at the CEO lead, leadership team and says, well, do you want me to make my number? Because as soon as I take that much resource away from the performance zone, I've put the number at risk for sure. The correct answer is, yes, I want you to make your number, but it is more important that we complete this transformation. Once you start a transformation, the one thing you must not do is fail. So you should think twice about starting one. But once you start, it becomes the number one priority, and therefore the productivity zone is number three. And by the way, anything in the incubation zone can just quiesce. Because the last thing we're going to do is take a second thing out of the incubation zone and make the resource crisis even worse. I say that, by the way, but that's not actually true. The 54 companies on that list that failed all had more than one thing going on at the same time. More than one incubation zone business trying to get into the transformation zone. You can imagine why that doesn't work. There's not enough resources for one. There sure as hell isn't enough resources for two. If you try two or more at the same time, you are guaranteeing failure. Okay? If you try one, you have a chance. By the way, it's still a risk. OK, so that, the game here then is you have to enlist everyone in making this change. That's, that's what the charismatic founder CEO is doing. But th what we're trying to do with this framework is say, voluntarily people can, in a principled way, apply this framework and say, well, this is what we are collectively deciding to do. We're changing our compensation system. We're changing. Everybody in the company owns that star, not just the general manager of the new business, not just the salespeople assigned to sell it. Everybody owns that star, which means everybody's compensation will either rise or fall based, not exclusively, but I'll bet at least 50% on whether that star comes into being or not. So it's got, it's got to be that clear, OK? Now, interesting, that's an interesting one. But I would say that's probably one out of 10 cases for when you use the transformation zone. I think the other nine are when you have a established line of business that is, and Microsoft uses the phrase, under existential threat, meaning the world has changed such that you are Kodak and it's digital photography, or Fuji, or whatever. By the way, the way Kodak and Fuji responded were very different. Kodak could not get to the, to, to the transformation zone. It just couldn't get there. I mean, eventually, it had, eventually it went bankrupt and came back as a different company. Fuji actually took its chemistry capability and went into cosmetics and actually was able to make a transition. No, you know, so, 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 but the key idea here is you can't leave the business in the performance zone once it's under existential threat. You have to move it into the transformation zone. This is what Microsoft is doing very well. They've done it with Azure. That was their back office software business. Cloud was an existential threat to on-premise back office software. So they, they invested heavily in Azure. When you do that, you make it the number one priority. 
you actually raid your incubation zone to get anything to help you modernize. The goal here is to modernize an, a, a business under existential threat, to get it back into the game as fast as you can. But while you're doing it, you give it relief from performance zone metrics and performance zone culture. You give it, you give it, you say, look, for the next two to three years, we know you're gonna, we, we're going through a J curve. And you, you go through a J curve. The only place you can go through a J curve is in the upper left hand quadrant of this thing. So we're going through a J curve. And so we know we're going to miss our numbers. By the way, when your business is under existential threat, all those constituencies, the customers, the salespeople, the sales management, you know, the, the, the investors, the partners, they know it too. So when you actually struggle in the performance zone, you actually get more sympathy and more credit than you would if you did it voluntarily. So when you go through a J curve because you're responding to a crisis, your investors will be more loyal, your customers will be more loyal, your partners will be more loyal if they see you getting through it, right? So Azure has actually gotten a ton of goodwill to Microsoft. The amount of goodwill in Silicon Valley that Microsoft has gained in the last five years is astronomical. It's unprecedented. But it's because people see them, it's, okay, you guys are trying to reach out and change. And by the way, Office 365, same thing. Same thing, same, same game. Windows, not yet solved, okay? Not yet solved. But obviously Windows is under existential threat. 85% right? of the edge 10 years ago, less than 20% of the edge last quarter. So it's like, mm, okay, how does, that, how does that work? Okay. The idea behind this then is when you're doing a, a response, again, you're in the transformation zone, everyone has to support the response. And it has to be done with a principled basis of people voluntarily acknowledging this is the best outcome for our company, even though my division or my, my performance comp program actually gets penalized if we do this. That's why it can't be a political decision. It has to be a, a principal decision. So the rules, to, this total alignment is required. You cannot have people opting out of this program. If an executive opts out, they have to be fired w within like the week. I mean, literally, because, because if you teach people they can opt out, they will opt out. And so that, that, that and by the way, those 54 companies all were carrying executives who, who had opted out. So got to do that. Second thing is, it, it's got to be the number one priority, which doesn't, it's not normal to make it the number one priority. The normal priority is the performance zone, make your number, what's your question? But in this exceptional circumstances, you have to make it the number one priority. And you can only do one at a time. If you try to do more than one at a time, if you think putting all your eggs in one basket is risky, just remember that for chickens, they lay eggs one at a time. If the chicken tries to lay two eggs at the same time, it's bad for the eggs and it's bad for the chicken, okay? <laughs> so one egg at a time, okay, that's the game, okay? So just to close on this then, in terms of uh, uh, how we can pull this together as both partners and as uh, companies ourselves. So we're looking at the disruptions going on, and if we think the game is an infrastructure only game, our goal should be to optimize our existing operations. And we can play that game in the productivity zone. And we're set up to play that. And many of your customers are set up to play that. And in fact, that's what they want to do this year. And you should just sell them more good, cheaper, faster, better stuff, like Antonio was saying yesterday. That's what it's for. Most of the world, most of the time, is in the gray zone. That, that, and that's good. That's why we're a large industry. If what they're saying is, no, I need to modernize my existing business, either, either because organically I just think it's time, or maybe exceptionally because I'm under this existential threat. Now what we're saying is we're gonna change our operating model. So now you have to go into the performance zone because the performance zone leaders run the operating model that's visible and that's gonna be impacted by the new technology. They have, to, they have to support this. First of all, they have to support it strategically. Then they have to support the re-engineering of their business processes and they have to fund it. So the issue here is there's 99% of the world's budget is sitting in there it's there to support projects that you're interested in and next generation IT projects, but only if you can tie them to the modernization of the performance zone. That's what they want to buy from you. They don't want to buy any product or service that you, that you would name on a, on a line card. They want to buy an outcome. A and the outcome is I need to modernize my operating model. So, mo and if you want to be a vertical specialized reseller, 
what you should ask yourself is, what is happening to the operating model in my, in my target industry? How does this operating model fail under the digital, or how is it being threatened with existential threat in the, in the, with, by these digital waves that I was showing? And how could we help in the simplest and, and most direct way help this customer just get back into the game? The thing about being an established business is, you're not in courtship mode. You're not trying to win a spouse. You're trying to stay married, okay? Just keep up, right? That's what Maria, I've been married for 40, 48 years. So you know what? Just, Jeffrey, keep up. You know, you don't have to like, you don't have to like be Brad Pitt. You know, just kind of keep up, you know? Keep up. So, so but that's what, that's what most companies have to do. If, if your customer sees you keeping up, they will be loyal to you. People don't want to switch vendors, but, they, but if they see you falling behind, and they see you falling more and more behind. And if they hear you being in denial, then they gotta go, okay, okay, I, I, guess, I guess I do have to find a new vendor, right? And then, you know, there is the opportunity to say, look, there's a greenfield opportunity we have here where we can prosecute the disruptive stuff without, without disrupting ourselves. And, and now we are talking about the transformation zone. That's bringing that star out of the incubation zone and saying, guys, this, this could be big. This could be our, our, our next big thing. So just to kind of close then, the, 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 whether it's for ourselves or for our customers, I think it's the same, the same recipe. When you look at this digital disruption, bring it into the incubation zone. Get familiar with it. Don't just do some big acquisition about something you know nothing about, okay? Get in there and do it yourself. Start something organically, see what happens. And then as you begin to get experience with it, you can make the call. Is this something that I should take into the productivity zone in order to optimize existing operations? Is this something I should take into the performance zone and modernize my operating model to keep up with, with the next generation things, and ward off an existential threat? Or is this something I need to take into the transformation zone either to ward off an existential threat that's hit me now or, or, to, or, to, or to define the next big line of business in my portfolio. This, the, this game, and when you're sitting and having a dialogue with your customers, I think it's really important that you figure out with them which arrow is the arrow that they should be on with you. Which arrow are you playing? And then do you then develop the relationships and develop the vocabulary and the thought leadership that relates to that arrow. And, and don't try to push one arrow into, a, into another work. So those are some of the ideas I, had, uh, I wanted to share with you. Uh, all three of these things are, are, are positive returns. There's not a good one or a bad one. I think there's just the one that fits. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. I had a joy, joy to have a chance to talk with you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Okay. I think we have like two minutes or three minutes uh, left over. If anybody had, like if your crap detector went off and you wanted to sort of, <laughs> raise an objection or, or a quick question, we probably have a, a second. But other than that, you're, you're on, kind of on a, yes, okay, one back there, yes, please. Okay, so, so and, and a version, Apple did a version of that, I think also with IBM, if the same idea. So, so yeah, I, I think as, as, as people are looking at this, what I think they're trying to do is set up an opportunity to modernize the operating model by bringing a, an alliance or, 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 or a set of capabilities together. The anxiety customers have is who's, who's gonna take end-to-end -end accountability for that? I think maybe that's kind of what partners ultimately can step into and say, I'm Accenture or I'm Deloitte or I'm KPG, I, I'm gonna do it. Um, I, think, I think people have anxiety in general about consumer companies really having enough of the interest of the enterprise at heart. So I think the CIO is always gonna to tend toward the enterprise vendor, in this case, either Cisco or IBM or HP, that kind of thing. Um, but the problem is a lot of the cool new stuff involves incorporating the consumer innovation into the enterprise. In fact, that's kind of the theme of the next 10 years. We're just essentially taking all of the systems of engagement that consumers have been using for 10 years and saying, how do we, f how do we bring that back into the enterprise? It's kind of like client server all over again, but it's, it's more like digital disruption, but it's the same idea. Okay, you guys have to get to the next thing. I'll hang out for a few minutes, but thank you very much. Enjoy to have a chance to talk to you. <laughs>